<laughs> Why was your father crying when he drove you home from prom night? I'm sorry? So I just finished re-watching Strange Tale of the Johnsons and let's just say that, yeah, still fucking awful. This movie was made in 2011 and it was the original Rick Roll but movie version for like as long as I can remember. Cause you, cause it has an innocuous name. You said like, here, watch this movie for fella. Only 30 minutes and then the person watching and next thing you know, boom, they're kind of hooked and then they have to watch the tragedy that unfolds and this, that, and third. And one thing I will mention though, despite literally everything that can go wrong does go wrong in this movie, it has a quasi happy ending. When I say quasi, I mean the problems are dealt with for lack of a better word. And essentially it's a hard reset, except people who were there in the first place aren't there anymore. What's up guys, FNL 47 here. Welcome to watch for the plot. And today we are going to dive deeper into the Strange about the Johnsons. Now, the strange things about the strange things about the Johnsons, I had to say it, sorry, is that it seems like it's a permanent climax at all times. Essentially, what I'm trying to say here. It's like imagine if Stephen King had a son who continuously violated him again and again and again and again. And Stephen King wanted to write a book about it, but the son kind of does want to do that. And I'm burning this. And if I see another copy lying around, it's gonna be more than a slap on the wrist. That's basically the premise here. Now, I think the main reason why this is so like vile is because people blame the wife slash mother herself for not doing anything about the situation. But if you truly think about it, think about it this way. You have been, you know, you, you've seen some signs here and then about like some weird stuff within the son Isaiah and the father. And you're like, okay, wh whatever, that's, that's a bit weird. I'll, I'll go off, whatever. And then you see the atrocity happen in front of your eyes. And you know, he's disappointed to participate in it. And Isaiah is like overly enthused about it. And then she has two options. One, completely ruin her life, divorce the husband, get the son arrested, and have her life just shattered. Or two, completely forget about it and just glaze over it, and hopefully just things will get better. And she always pick number two. Now, it starts off, of course, with the classic scene here, you know, um, Isaiah is just enjoying picture. Who's the picture of? Take a wild guess. Exactly. And then we flash to the wedding, and then the wedding is where the mother saw them in the act of it all behind the fence, which is very weird because the family reunion aspect there is too relatable for me. I can almost feel that happening if I go to the next family reunion. I'm gonna be really paranoid, paranoid now, but whatever. That's besides the point. So after seeing that, and now she's in complete cope mode. She's complete denial phase. And whenever anything has to happen that's related to one or the other, she tries to just tamp it down. Like you got this scene here. You know, these aren't for me, Dad. I got them for you. I'll have one. Well, they're dads, so you're gonna have to ask him first. Would you like one? Oh, maybe later. We have to talk about the bathtub scene. The reason the bathtub scene is as enamoring as it is, is because at this time, the father, he wrote a book called The Cocoon Man. Now, the cocoon man is essentially him trying to explain what he's been through and how he has to deal with it and what he can do to get out of the situation. And he tried to give it to his wife, but his wife wasn't there. The son looked at the book, read the book, and then this scene happened here. I tell you, Dad, from a poet, I expect more eloquence. So yeah, they're basically talking back and forth, almost at a calm level, like as if the son wasn't about to catch him, snitching to the cops or anything. It's very, very weird thing going on. He's, he's, he's eerily calm. It's almost like Isaiah knows that his father won't snitch if he confronts him, because Isaiah knows his father's scared of him. So therefore, he's taking advantage of the power dynamic to just calmly talk to him and act like, you know, everything is okay. As long as you just forget about this, everything will be fine. It's very eerie, very odd to even experience. Experience more and more dread because you can see the father just continuously just not want to be here not want to exist on this planet earth it's like holy fuck it, it's it's quite enamoring how they were able to display such dismay in his face on a continuous basis now it may be because the way his face is built looks like he already looks like he's faking everything he wants to do in life but it adds to the factor of how depressing the show is now the mother continuously just ignoring the situation i feel like it isn't her fault now notice i'm not going through the entire plot it's because i want to talk about the point specifically this time so the mother ignoring everything right i feel like it's not because she hates the dad no that's not the case it's because like i mentioned before she doesn't want to shatter her home life she does 
doesn't want to be rid of the only life she's known. She's been married to the man for 20 years, 20 plus years, I assume. And she had a kid for about 20 plus years as well. And he's a successful kid. He has a job. He has a wife. You know, he's, he's been married for like 20, like three years at this point. It's just everything's going fine. And then you find this information about like a year ago and then boom, your whole life shattered. Now, the final scene, she can no longer cope because when Isaiah did, you know, the bathtub scene with him, the father had it. He's like, you know what? I am going publish this cocoon man and tell everyone about what's going on in my house. I am sick and tired of everything going on. I need to let everybody know it has to be out. It is killing me on the inside. It is burning a hole in my chest. He's, he's just about to walk out the door. And of course, Isaiah stops him and then this wonderful speech here. If you want me to apologize, I'll apologize. And I am sorry about what happened last night. And I did go too far. But what about you? Am I totally alone here? Am I just this abusive monster and you're some sad, helpless victim? Or does it take two to tango? And one thing I do have to mention about the speech though is like, it perfectly captures how abusers do the victim mentality to make it seem like the victims were basically at fault as to why this whole thing happened in the first place. Holy oh, fuck it. After that speech, clearly the father is just at a loss for words. He just dips, gets ran over by a van, and Isaiah literally loses his mind. Now, I think at that point, the mom just lost her mind. Now, there are no names, so don't, don't get out of my ass on my names, because there are no names. Mom lost her mind, because the reason she lost her mind is because she can no longer have this lie, this glaze of a lie, over her facade of a life because one of the family members are dead. One of three. No? But now she has to actually confront this reality because if she doesn't, she will just be in complete denial and completely go on a spiral while she's depressed and then just go into the void and obviously kill herself. Instead of doing that, she decides to do the brave thing unironically and confront Isaiah about what the fuck just happened. Why did he die? Off of me! I'm warning you, mother. You don't warn me! Warn, warn, warn. No. The thing is, right, she didn't say, <laughs> smart, smart, smart. She didn't say, oh my God, why did you run over that car? You know, she immediately went right to the core of the situation. She said, 10 years ago, why was your father crying at the prom? It, it just, it's almost like she was waiting for a perfect moment to actually attack, for lack of better words, on the situation. And I feel like even though she did wait 10, 20 years at this point, it's still something, you know? When, when did it start? Mom, you're emotional. <laughs> She could have just gone to the void and killed herself. She could have easily just committed suicide, but she did. And I feel like that speaks a lot to just the whole mentality of being in a fuck up situation. Like you can't win either way. It's a loser situation. Either you confront it immediately and have everything you've ever known just shattered or, you know, wait until you cannot wait any longer and just have that completely depressing, just mind-numbing existence on your soul, but have a life that somewhat resembles the one you used to have. I'm just shocked, okay? I'm just definitely shocked. I don't know why I love laughing at this movie so much. Maybe because of the concept of rape was so shocking me at the time, that's probably what it was. But now, looking back, looking at all these shows I reviewed, Santa Third, all these fucking atrocities reviewed, it's made me realize that it just had an illicit emotional reaction so hard, so fast, so quickly to a show I've rewatched before. Because again, it's been like four or five years since I rewatched the show, and it's still bringing out like hardcore emotions on me. Now, again, the whole point of the movie, I want to say, was to show how the abuse slash abusey relationship goes on to the highest extent, i.e. just continuous rape continuously. And it's supposed to elicit a response out of you. It's supposed to make you realize that, hey, you know, abuse isn't as straightforward as you think it is. It's it's a very complex situation. It cannot just be solved by beat him back. It cannot just be solved by get a gun. I mean, it's, it's a very complex situation that includes multiple power dynamics and is the reason as to why so many situations continue to go on for as long as they do. Now, I was expecting this to be, you know, a little complex before, but again, it was very tragic. And at the end, she does end up killing her son in a very, you know, let's just say a very 2010s fashion. Now, one thing I would have to note, and the question I have to say here is like, she ended up burning the cocoon man. I don't know if it was her or him, but the cocoon man was in the fire when she killed her son. Now, there's one thing I do have to mention though. When the father ran out and got ran over by a van, he had the cocoon man in his hand because that's what he was trying to do to leave when the son was talking to him. Remember, I sat down on the stairs and when he died, the cocoon man was right next to him. The full novel explaining his entire abusive son's, you know, tirade and how he got to be where he is now. And they don't really determine whether or not who picked up the novel and took it with them. So I assume the mother picked it up and I assume she read it and I assume she confronted Isaiah afterwards. 
Now, after that, why it was put in the fire? Again, I assume the mother put the book in the fire to completely forget about the past. She's completely just cut her ties off with everything and anything a Johnson male lineage has done to tarnish her perfect life. Now again, is she the perfect person? She's supposed to just tell the cops immediately. Well, again, it is complicated. And no, the son could just easily deny it the entire time. And it's kind of hard to take male sexual assault seriously because, you know, we're fucking men. And society doesn't really view that as a serious thing. So it's going to be hard for that. Given the fact that she also killed him, her best case scenario would be to just keep the book, right? Hold up. I'm going back on what I just said, because if she did kill him and the cops come by, which they will have to come by, obviously, unless you want to like dispose the body like Breaking Bad, like Walter White's bullshit, otherwise it's still going to be there. Now, what I was saying was you can use the book as evidence to see why she killed him in the first place and to why he fought back. But since she burned the book, she's focused on getting her past complete or, or she was going to kill herself. after confronting him and the reason why she had enough gumption to even talk to him in the first place because she was thinking about you know committing suicide in the first place so the burn of the book was essentially just like just burning bridge the final bridge the final connection to this real world and then i assume there she just committed suicide because they don't they don't mention it at all it just ends right at the end of isaiah's life which is a very fitting ending of course obviously it allows you to think but a numerous amount of theories that could explain why the book was burning at the end. That was it. Yes, this movie was 30 minutes long. Yes, this review is about almost as long as the movie itself. I feel like I got most of my emotions out of here. It definitely, um, it hit a lot harder than I thought it would because it just, I'll explain this. One of the main reasons why I thought it was funny because it was during my edgy phase. My edgy phase, I just thought, haha, rape, haha, murder, haha, assault, very, very funny, haha, hee hee. I'm growing out of my edgy phase now. I'm like, oh, okay, that kind of. Yeah, that's kind of fucked up. Alright guys, I don't know how to but if I did, it wouldn't matter because no one makes it part of the video. Good night.